I want to welcome everyone to the uh, Kentucky State Police Headquarters for an important announcement. And I, uh, I don't know if this mic is working, but I suspect my voice carries well enough. Can everyone hear okay? Well, again, welcome. I think this is an auspicious day, an important day. Many of you have by now have heard about this initiative, but I want to be clear, this will save lives. My script said we believe it'll save lives. I'm telling you it will, and it has already. So before we get started, though, I want to introduce a few people here. we got some important guests here today that uh, all of you are, but we want to introduce a few people who've made uh, a special trip and driven several miles to be here. I want to start with my friends here I've worked with for several years, Jackie Steele, the Commonwealth's attorney from his area. That's, that is the what district? 27th. 27th. I, my guess was off by a couple, so the 27th. And your predecessor is with you, I think, Tom Handy, my friend, longtime prosecutor, and uh, knows his way around the Commonwealth. Thank you for your service, both of you. Uh, Larry Forgey's here as well. Where's La Larry? Is right there. I, I walked right past you, Larry. I'm sorry. Good to see you again. Great to see you, Larry. Thank you for all your service as well. Looking more casual. Yeah. Than normal, oh, exactly. I didn't. It was. Pretty buttoned up. That's awesome. Yeah. I, the scarf was obscuring your face, Larry. Um, from Unite, Nancy Hale is here. My good friend Nancy. Where she's right there. Sorry about your foot, Nance. Hope that uh, hope you heal quickly. Your friends Tom Bacini is here as well, and Everett Johnson. And of course, Tom is the chairman of the board. I've already introduced Tom and Everett. Where are you? Yeah, there you are in the back. Thank you, Everett, for your service as well. I think Elizabeth Nichols was going to try to make it from drug courts. Did she make it in the building? Okay, she did not. Um, before we go any further, I also want to recognize two captains who sort of uh, really piloted this in, in a very literal way. Uh, obviously, Jennifer Sandlin at the Pikeville Post who's now in Hazard. I just saw Jennifer. She's right here to my right. The lights are in my face. I apologize, Jennifer. And with you, of course, Captain Kurt Hall from Richmond. I know, again, two very proactive posts, as they all will be in the future, but thank you for piloting such an important initiative, which we'll hear about from the commissioner in a minute. And now it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to all of you the governor, and let me say this before I give him the mic. Um, many of you may have heard me say this, but I think it, it bears repeating, and I'm, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, this governor, when I first interviewed for this job, uh, which is a passion of mine, and I, I would not want to be anywhere else in the world today than to, than to do what I do, and that's uh, head the Justice Cabinet. And the governor gave me that opportunity, and, but it, was, it wasn't after several hours of interviews and time to get to know one another, but the very first time I actually formally met this governor was to interview for this job, and he walked into the room with a book under his arm. Uh, he's a voracious reader. Uh, it was Dreamland. Many of you have now read that book. I know many of you, Nancy, in this room, uh, probably have read it twice. It is a textbook, but it's also an incredible read. If you haven't, I encourage it. We began a conversation, and I left that room from, for someone who has not been in, the, in the, that criminal justice trench, Jackie, as a prosecutor maybe, but for someone who, who again, has viewed it from an outside perspective but un understands that it is a three-legged stool that works. It's interdiction, it's education, and it's treatment. And I think that's embodied here at the state police, and it's embodied in this initiative you hear about in a minute. But this governor understood that from the word go, and that's why I have the greatest pleasure and the greatest pride in working for him. And that's our governor of the Commonwealth, Matt Bevan. Yes, brother. Thank you. Let's be on that side. We keep balancing each other yeah. out here. <clears throat> Thanks for being here. Thanks for caring about this. Some of you, it's your day-to-day -day job. Uh, commissioner, again, who will follow me momentarily, uh, this is something we've talked about also from the beginning. It's something he has a whole lot of personal experience about this initiative that he'll speak to. It's something we didn't invent, we didn't pioneer, but I think we're taking it to a level uh, that has not been seen anywhere else. And we'll talk about what it is and what it isn't, this angel initiative. But the real catalyst for it, I think you're aware of, and the catalyst for it uh, is the fact that we have a big opioid addiction problem in Kentucky and in America. It just came, I spent the last several days uh, with other governors from around the country, with the president, vice president, with members of the administration, with Alex Azar, who's the head of uh, Health and Human Services for this country. And I'll tell you what, this is a big, big problem. Uh, it's, it is systemic throughout the country. And the reason we are looking at new initiatives, the reason we're taking things like this on is because what we've been doing traditionally, historically, has not been as effective as we would want it to be. We have an obligation to our fellow citizens. We have an obligation to protect and to serve the people of the Commonwealth, the people who are paying the bill.
But we also have the obligation to make sure people don't slip through the cracks. And we have an obligation to make sure that we are taking care of every Kentuckian. And that if we don't, we ultimately reap what we sow. We really do. We, the ounce of prevention that we can spend is worth a pound of cure. And so I think it's important for us to understand what this angel initiative is. And the commissioner will speak to it. It's not a dereliction of the responsibilities that we currently have and know that we have, but it's a way to be smarter about the way we go about things. Last year in Kentucky, more than 1,400 people died of an overdose. Many more than that overdosed. 1,400 people died. Today, if this is an average day in Kentucky, we'll have three or four people die of an overdose in Kentucky. Think about that. These are our fellow citizens. These are somebody's kid, somebody's parent, somebody's uncle, somebody's brother, somebody's sister. These are real human beings. Very, very, very few people set out to abuse drugs. Very few people. It is a slippery slope. We have an obligation to take care of our fellow citizens. It's why we've set up things like Don't Let Them Die. Com. It's an initiative. It's a PSA. We're putting a lot of money and resources behind it. Don'tletthemdie.com. It's a way for people to get connected. It's why we have 1-800 numbers now. If somebody dials 8338, which I guess technically 800 numbers aren't 800 numbers anymore, but you're with me. But 833, toll-free number, 8338-KY-HELP. 8338-KY-HELP. You get a live person for the better part of the day. We're trying to get it to the point where you'll get a live person 24 hours a day. But you'll get somebody who, if, they is, if there is need and there is a bed somewhere, they're not going to simply say, hey, sorry, the local rehab center is full. There's a one, three, eight day, eight week, whatever the case might be, waiting period. We'll be able to connect you to any available bed, any available slot in the entire Commonwealth of Kentucky. It may be close, it may be far, but the point is we'll get you to some help. That's the purpose behind this ANGEL initiative as well. It's to make sure we get people the help they need because an addicted population is not good. 75% plus or minus given the jail or the prison, certainly at the local and county level, the vast majority, three quarters of the people that are in there are in our prison system for drug-related activity. Direct drug use, drug abuse, petty crime associated with the drug addiction that they have. This is a societal cost that's big. It's bigger than just the cost of addiction treatment, just bigger than the cost of just incarceration. we got to get our arms around it because here's what I'll tell you. Sadly and not proudly, we're losing this battle. We are. It isn't for any lack of effort. These guys are fighting harder and longer and doing more than they've ever done before. But the reality is it's not enough because the overwhelming amount of addiction is winning out. Something has to give. This is the catalyst for the ANGEL initiative. And I will, again, I, I don't know that I was supposed to introduce him, but I'll save you the trouble and then we can uh, switch sides here. I, I want to introduce the commissioner. This is a guy who I got to know, again, similar fashion to Secretary Tilly, Tilly as, as a part of the introduction uh, that came as a part of the interview process. This is a guy who has decades of law enforcement on a whole number of fronts, including many of them dedicated to how we get our arms around this drug problem in America and in Kentucky. But he's also an individual who, when I met him, was the chief of police in a community that had piloted this project in Kentucky, this initiative. It began initially in Gloucester, Massachusetts, of all places, a place known more for the fishermen, the Gloucester fishermen, than anything else. But they have a rampant problem. And they had pioneered this problem in the project. And this is a, a man who, despite his years of experience and the ability to maybe just assume he had it all figured out or that he'd seen it all before or he had an idea, he said, listen, there's better, smarter ways we could go about this. And so as the chief of police in Jefferson Town, Kentucky, which is a, a, a suburb of Louisville, essentially, he said, we're going to roll this program out and we're going to see what kind of an impact it can make. And that's exactly what he's done. 
He can speak to exactly what that impact is, what his motivations were for doing it then. But it was one of the reasons that when I met him, I said, this is a man I want running the Kentucky State Police. Interestingly, he hadn't had an experience in the Kentucky State Police. Of all the places he worked for through the decades, Kentucky State Police was one he had not. For those of you who are in the gray uniforms, you know that sometimes there's a little bit of question. You bring somebody in from outside the ranks, that can be a little bit dicey at times. That's why we brought Alex with him, just in case there was trouble. Because you bring a guy like Alex Payne, who incidentally was his deputy, his assistant police chief in Jefferson Town. And I did check with the mayor of Jefferson Town to make sure I wasn't leaving them hanging. I checked with Rick as well to make sure that I wasn't leaving them hanging to take their top two guys. But their top two guys were outstanding. And with or without Alex, this is the right man for the job, but especially with Alex Payne. These two men have taken the Kentucky State Police to a whole nother level of professionalism, and it is why I am confident that we're going to be able to get our arms around this. I consider him a friend. I consider him somebody that I can learn a lot from, and I'm grateful very much that he's willing to serve the Commonwealth of Kentucky as our Commissioner of the State Police, Rick Sanders. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for those kind words. I, I'm extremely proud to stand before you today to announce the ANGEL initiative. But I think it's important that you understand how we arrived here. When I was the chief in Jefferson Town, Kentucky, on a, on a Sunday, I was in my office, and one of my commanding officers happened to be there at the same time, and he came running into my office, and I said, what is wrong? He said, my daughter is dying. And we drove about four blocks from the police station, and we found his 24-year-old daughter dead in the floor of an overdose. His wife showed up, a friend of mine, and I had to hold her back because she wanted to go hug her daughter one last time. And then we had another officer there whose twin brother died of a heroin overdose. And I started thinking, what can we do to, to help the people of our community? Look, I'm a strong law and order guy. I've been in law enforcement over 40 years, spent 24 years with DEA, spent a lot of time in South and Central America targeting the cartels, bringing that poison into our country. And I still believe in that. But when I got a point in Jefferson Town where I thought we had to do more, I called Chief Leonard Campanello, who was the chief in Gloucester, Massachusetts. He's the one that originated the ANGEL initiative. I said, Chief, I would like for you to come down for a round table. I had my mayor, I had my staff, I had mental health professionals, addiction specialists. I had recovering addicts at that table. And I said, Leonard, what can we do to help this, this problem? He explained to me, he said, Rick, I, I appreciate the invitation. He said, we started this program on June 1st in 2015 in Gloucester, Mass. In the first year, we treated or, or, or facilitated getting people into treatment, over 450 have been placed into treatment in Gloucester. But just as important to me as a police chief, he said the first year we reduced property crime 33 percent. That's important. So I decided we were going to do this in Jefferson Town. I have a real strong sergeant there that, that helped me and, and did the legs work on this. And I met with the governor to interview for this job. I never met the governor before, and, and much like um, Mr. Tilly, we discussed the book. He's, I, I have met people here that have as much passion about this as I have. John Tilly is very passionate about this problem. Governor Bevan is very passionate about this problem. But I don't want to leave one person out, and that's Nancy Hale. Nancy is extremely passionate about this problem. She runs Operation Unite, and it is a model for the rest of the country. She came to me and met me in my office right after I'd gotten here, and she said, Rick, would you consider putting somebody on the board? I said, I'll do better than that. I'll be on the board. And I've been an active member of that board ever since. We also increased our interdiction teams here in Kentucky. We now have five strong interdiction teams trying to stop those traffickers from bringing the poison into the Commonwealth. I'll highlight one case alone. Last summer, we worked with Customs Enforcement at Lexington's airport, 
and we seized 70 kilos of cocaine and 30 pounds of crystal meth. That has an impact. We're going to focus more on those people that are bringing that stuff into the Commonwealth and poisoning our citizens. And they've had great success in doing that with those five interdiction teams. But last March, I called Jennifer Sandlin, who was our post commander at Pikeville. I'll be honest with you, some of these post commanders and some of my staff thought I'd lost my mind when I mentioned this angel initiative for the Kentucky State Police. And I called Jennifer and I said, Jennifer, I want you to help me with this. And she was skeptic, a skeptic at first. But if you talk to her in a little while, you'll find out that she's bought into this program and has actually brought people in to the program to help. Additionally, while I was in Jefferson Town, the, the, the bell rang and we had an armed robbery at Cooch Liquors. And for those people that live in J-Town, they know don't rob Cooch Liquor because his gun's a lot bigger than yours. <laughs> but this young man who was addicted to heroin went in to rob Cooch Liquors. He pulled a fake gun that looked like a real gun. The guy behind the counter pulled a real gun and shot him in the chest. That young man survived, fortunately. I don't know how because it nicked his heart. So he goes out to the getaway car with two of his best friends, and they did what a best friend will do. They took him around the corner and threw him out of the car into the parking lot. That kid is now serving time for armed robbery, all because of a drug addiction. So what does the ANGEL initiative do? The ANGEL initiative opens the front door to all of our 16 post areas, and somebody that has an addiction and is seeking help before they ever rob Cooch Liquors, before they ever get into criminal justice, the system, they come to us and say, I need help. And our troopers will facilitate getting them help. I also leaned on Nancy. I said, Nancy, you got to help me because the state is a lot different than Jefferson Town. I knew everybody in J-Town. All of our post areas are different. I went to Jeremy Slinker, who's our operations colonel. He said, Commissioner, trust me, this will work. These post commanders are smart enough to figure out how it will work for their particular part of the state. But we had a round table in Pikeville. It was attended. It was a, a big crowd. Everybody was ready for the ANGEL initiative. And J Jennifer is one of our biggest supporters. It was started a soft opening uh, about a year ago. And to date, I was planning my notes for this morning. I said we've already placed nine people into treatment. And that's hardly even with this thing up and running. And then Josh came in to me and said, no, Commissioner, it's 10. We just placed another one. We had someone go into our London post and say, I need help. That post facilitated getting that person to Ashland and into treatment. And I hope that that person is able to stay clean and sober. It does work. I've got success stories, I can tell you. And then one last thing. I had to change two cultures in Jefferson Town. Number one, I had to change the culture of law enforcement, that this is our job. Our job is to save lives. And I had to change the culture of those that are addicted to trust the police, that they could actually walk into the police station, give them bindles of heroin, the, the heroin would be disposed of, and they would be taken to a treatment facility. But they have to come in on their own volition before they ever encounter the law enforcement community committing a crime. One of the sergeants I had to convince in J-Town is a pretty hard-nosed sergeant, been around a long time. He said, Chief, this is not our job. I said, it is our job. A few months after that meeting, his son died of a heroin overdose. And I went back after becoming commissioner here and went back for a gaslight festival and went to the police station. I saw this car pull up to the front of the station. I saw a man and woman get out of the car, open the back door, and a young male get out of the car with them. It was obvious he was their son. Probably weighed 90 pounds soaking wet. And I saw that sergeant come out of the station and embrace that young man. He prayed with that family in the front parking lot of the police station, took them inside, and got that kid treatment. Trust me when I tell you we're not getting soft on crime. We're just getting smarter. We've got to help those people that are addicted. No matter how they ended up where they are, we've got to help them. And there are a lot of success stories I could go on to tell you. But that's why we have to do what we're doing. I'm happy to say in Jefferson Town, since 
its inception, they have placed over 60 people into treatment. And that's a small community, a smaller community. It works. It helps those addicted. It helps reduce crime. And more importantly, it's the right thing to do. So I'm proud to stand here with you this morning. Kurt Hall is our captain at the Richmond Post. I got a call from him saying, Commissioner, we're ready. Because we were kind of slow walking this thing because I didn't know what we do in Pikeville is much different than what we do in Mayfield. And we're trying to massage this to make it work. And he said, trust me, Commissioner, it'll work. They're blessed there because they have a male and facility, female facility close by that they have a great rapport with. And they're helping people get into treatment. So that's why we're here. We're here to announce the Kentucky State Police, the front door is open. If you have an addiction, come to us before you rob the liquor store. Come to us and let us get you the help that you need. And you can trust us to do that. And with that being said, I'll turn it back over to the Secretary. Uh, two tough acts to follow. Let me fill in a couple of gaps for those who may wonder one of the reasons that the state police was, um, you, you mentioned slow walk. I think it was, it was cautious and wise to move at a pace that, uh, we could, where we could guarantee, Nancy, as you know, that bed and guarantee that treatment slot uh, before we lost any credibility in these communities. They have to know that it's going to work and we're going to have that treatment slot or that bed. So that brings us me to the governor again. Uh, less than two years in, I guess two years now, but less than two years in, we were able to announce several things. Obviously, first few months, the Don't Let Them Die campaign that was referenced, where we have treatment locators now where people can get online and find it, and the number that you heard the governor reference where they can call and find it. This will not be a resource available only to those looking for treatment, but to judges and prosecutors, Jackie, where if you're trying to work that diversion that will save a prison bed and get somebody into treatment that will save their life as opposed to that, again, the damaging effects of incarceration um, and the incredible cost to the taxpayer with no return on investment. Um, you'll have that bed. You'll know where to find it. And then even more importantly is the 1115 waiver, which before we had this incredible limit on bed space, 16 beds per BHSO, which is a behavioral health facility essentially. And now that cap's coming off. So people will come to Kentucky and provide these beds this administration fought for over a year and a half to get that kind of waiver and that kind of des designation, which will expand treatment in this state and will lift that cap to get treatment. And keep in mind as well, for those of you that do this kind of thing, it's not always a treatment bed. Intensive outpatient treatment can be just as effective. It can be more cost effective and actually more effective to that person. Not, it's, there's not a one size fits all approach. Addictions are different. Treatment needs are different. Keep that in mind, and I know you all do. And, and again, I'm reminded, I was in uh, D.C. as was the governor doing some important work a couple of days ago, and Nancy, I'm reminded, I was in a room, and Kentucky and drug policy came up, and before I could brag on folks like you, Kentucky, it was mentioned that Kentucky is the gold standard when it comes to drug policy. But it is so acute, the problem. It is so acute here in Kentucky. We have to lead the country in drug policy, and that's what we are doing. And what the strides we've made in the last two years are really unbelievable. It was mentioned that we lost 404 Kentuckians. The overdose, uh, overdoses were mentioned. The deaths are, again, over 1,400 in 2016. They'll rise a little bit in 17, I'm afraid. We had 13,000 visits, Tom, to emergency rooms for overdoses. But now, because of the Don't Let Them Die campaign and that drug policy, Nancy, we're linking people immediately to treatment. Second state in the country to use a peer coach uh, strategy as well as a bridge clinic. And you know that very well, those of you at Unite. And think about the country. Kentucky's not alone. We lost more people to drug overdose deaths last year, 64,000, than we did during the entire tenure, over 10 years of the Vietnam War. So that's where we stand as a country, and that's why I'm so proud to stand with law enforcement and this governor and this administration to attack it from all levels. And joining with the treatment communities, I'll leave you with this thought before we open it up for questions and could hear from the, the, the captains of these posts. When we were in Pifel to talk about this and sort of that roundtable, Nancy, you remember the treatment providers in the communities came up one by one, almost, I mean, it's an emotional experience, almost a spiritual experience that day saying, we will guarantee a bed. You, 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 know, you open this program, you open your doors to these folks suffering from these disorders, these substance use disorders, people suffering, will guarantee the bed. One by one they came, and that's the way we build this treatment. That's the way we dig out of this. Can we open it up for questions? Any uh, members of the media? Anyone? Let, let's hear it. Yeah. I was wondering about 
Most yeah. Most commanders. Well, I was going to let you. Absolutely. If you don't mind, that'd be great. Okay. Just your experience about what your first thought was, what your some of what the command, uh, commissioner spoke mm -hmm. to, what was your hesitancy, uh, what have you seen happen? Okay. Um, this this yeah. isn't this isn't working, so no, it doesn't even matter. Just get it out of your way. Uh, the commissioner was right. Whenever he brought this to me at first, uh, I was, I would say, skeptical and hesitant because this is something new for law enforcement. And my first thought was, that's not really what we do. You know, we we take people to jail, and that's kind of what rehab was for us, and that's what we we knew it to be was they dry out once we take them to jail, and we didn't really keep track of them after that once they left the criminal justice system. And then, you know, I thought, I didn't sign up to be a trooper to take people to jail. Nobody signs up to be a police officer just to take people to jail. That's not what our main goal is, and that's what our main mission is. Our mission is to help people. And what more better way to help people than with the ANGEL initiative? And so I had to do a lot of research. I, had, I was thankful to have Nancy Hill on board with us because, you know, she was a great resource for us. And I also have a close friend that's a recovering heroin addict, and she's six years in recovery, and I'm so proud of her. And I called her up, and, I, and when I found out that we'd be piling in at Pavel, and I said, let's have lunch. I need to hear your story. I need to hear what your journey was and what worked for you and how, how you got to where you are now. And we did, and she has an amazing story, and, and she shared it with me, and I was like, I don't, is this going to work? I mean... Is this really going to help people? Are we going to be able to save people's lives? I, you know, because we want this to work. We don't want to fail at this. We, we're numbers driven in law enforcement. You know, we like to be able to track stuff and we like to add numbers to it because numbers are easy to understand and they're easy to follow. And she said, well, if you help one person, that's going to have a multiplying effect because that one person will not be committing crime. They will not be hurting their family. They'll be taking care of their children. They'll go and they'll get a job and they'll be a productive member of society. So when you help that one person, you're actually helping 50, 100 people. And, and that's true. That is absolutely true. You know, if we get, you know, so far we've taken not 10 people into treatment, and I don't know if all 10 of them are still there. I don't know if they're in recovery. But if we helped one, one person, that's really, we've really helped the community more ways than we can actually measure. Um, and I've been introduced to people in so many different aspects that I never would have been introduced before because of this initiative. People with UNITE, treatment center directors, health care officials, um, and I'm really thankful for that because they have really opened my eyes and they helped guide me along in this process. And it's going to be a continuing process. We absolutely need their help. We, you know, the state police cannot run the ANGEL initiative on their own. So I really want to give uh, thanks to those people that I reached out to and have reached out to me. Um, also, people who have offered to volunteer at my post that are really passionate about this because we have to have those people to keep this initiative moving forward. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, let's be honest. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And uh, having a new initiative like this, sometimes you just don't know. Uh, we spent a, lot of, spent a lot of time and effort saving lives on the highway. And the numbers are a whole lot higher, the people that die from addiction, than die on our highways. So we're proactive in highways and saving all of our initiatives. To save these people on the highways, we need to do things off the highways to save these people as well. The other thing that I realized is the state police is a brand. It's a brand of trust that is interwoven in the communities. And if we can stand behind this program, we already have the name of the trust. We have, we have the reputation of making a difference. And so it was, who am I to say that this wouldn't work? We just don't know, it's never been tried. So it was very easy to get our community on board and those involved in the community and those people at post. So, so far it's been, it's been a very, very effective program. Thanks, Kurt. Cool. Thanks. Any questions? Uh, anyone? Do you know, is this the first statewide agency in the country to take something on? Yeah. Or you know, we, along with the Michigan State Police, started this research and started it about the same time, but Michigan State Police is also doing what we're doing here in Kentucky.
Sure. It, it's pretty simple. Uh, the state police is open for business. Our front door is open. You walk into the, the post. We have 16 throughout the state that are depicted on the map. And someone will greet you at the front door, and you'll say, I'm here for help. I'm, I'm addicted. I need help. Typically, they'll get the administrative sergeant to come out and meet that person. In Pikeville, we were fortunate because we had Nancy and Operation Unite. And what we would do is call Debbie and say, Debbie, we have somebody that needs treatment. And they would facilitate taking that person as the angel to that treatment facility. But in Kurt's post area, because the treatment facilities are so close, the trooper is the angel. He or she, they'll first of all do a warrant check to make sure they're not wanted for anything. If they are, then they have to get all that cleaned up before we can help them. And, and then we will do a background on that person and get them somewhere for help. I mentioned the one that started in London that ended up in Ashland. There was another one, Jennifer, it was post 13, I believe, started over in Eastern Kentucky, ended up at the healing place in Louisville. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to take them where there's a bed, and that, that's the problem. There aren't enough beds for these people. Or we're going to take them somewhere to get them the medical help that they need for detox and then into treatment. And, you know, I've been reminded by Alex Payne, my partner. He says, boss, we've been doing this since 1948. We have helped people that are addicted to alcohol, people that have other addictions. This is nothing new. It's just something we're formalizing and advertising. And that's what we're doing here today is advertising. We want to help people. We're not going soft. If you rob Cooch Liquors, you're going to have to get treatment while you're incarcerated. But if we can get them before they ever get into crime, like I showed the results in Gloucester, 33% reduction of property crime the first year. But that's how it works if it answers your question. Let me say one other thing, too, and maybe you picked up on this. The intent is not to turn our law enforcement officers into social workers. Mm -hmm. It's not to make them now have to follow on with these individuals. The fact that the post commander literally does not know what has become of the people is not bad. It's actually good. It's because her responsibility and that of her teams is to secure the community to provide safety to that community. This is one step in that. And then they've handed it off to people for whom that is their professional calling and responsibility. And that is the whole point, is that we are the entryway, we are the way through which people can get on that path to recovery. And that those that will be part of the facilitation of that first step will then go back to what it is that they are trained and paid to do, which is to protect and serve the people of our community. <coughs> I do. Yes, I'd like to focus on this. This is so critical. 1,400 people died last year of an overdose. Thousands and thousands of others overdose. Four people will die today of this issue. With all due respect to every single thing that's being considered by our legislature, if we allow that many people to die in Kentucky, and we don't cover it because we want to trump it with something else that we can talk about at a later point, shame on us. And I would like us to focus for the purpose of our time here on this issue because it's that important. Any other questions about this initiative? Yes, sir. Yeah, but I think there's one thing that's been omitted that we need to let people know. There are funds from the state, from organizations like Unite that will pay for treatment and a person mm -hmm. doesn't need to stay home trying to find money for that absolutely no go ahead governor that's a good point i mean the reality is there are resources available and not the least of which are now being unleashed by the federal government as well the federal government i was with the president a couple days ago and this was a topic of conversation what's happening in our schools topic of conversation the opioid crisis topic of conversation a lot of them but those two dominated an amazing amount of the discussion between the governors and the president and what they reiterated is the fact that they're going to be expending about 50 billion dollars and correct me if that number is wrong, but I believe it's $50 billion is what's being proposed That's right. by the federal government to ultimately be disseminated down to states like ours to be able to address this in ways that are best for us. So in addition to the resources that already exist and the ways in which we already have to connect people, we're now going to be armed with increasing amounts of dollars to be able to make beds more available, to get people to them more expeditiously, 
and to be able to address this problem more effectively. So those things are underway, and we're only going to be spending more time and attention and treasure on this than we have in the past. And Tom, the governor's budget did find a way to effectively double the money we had a couple of years ago uh, to use in, in various ways, but principally on treatment and innovative ways uh, to battle the scourge. Um, beyond that, there's federal money. There's the uh, 1115 waiver. When that cap comes off and when se several things happen as, as a result of that, you'll see more providers who can be, uh, well, who, who feel like they can locate in Kentucky. Before, if they were limited to 16 beds or elsewhere, they couldn't, be, couldn't even break even. And so this is not a money-making venture, but they, these businesses have to break even who do provide some excellent treatment. And we've got to be smarter about where we direct people. There are some fly-by-night providers, and we've been very vigilant to make certain that those fly-by-night providers uh, are run out of the state and, uh, and not, not welcome back anytime soon. Um, and let me add something, too, about the state police. Again, great point by the governor and the commissioner about nobody's going soft on the other side of interdiction. I said something yesterday in committee to assure the legislature the state police, I have county judges coming to me off the record telling me that the number that, that the state police is taking off our highways in terms of interdiction, stopping cars that have, you know, large loads of drugs to, to maybe traffic here or elsewhere, but traveling through our state, the rate at which our state police, undermanned and underfunded, by the way, state police, despite our best efforts, we're asking for more now from the legislature, but in that regard, they're filling the jails so quickly with these people selling, profiting, commercially trafficking, not addicts. But we have to also change the model where our prisons don't reflect 65% admission rates from property and low-level drug offenses. So we've got to flip this model where we spend our resources at that very thing and we give money to the state police to interdict and then also to treat those who don't need to be in our prison cells. And that's, that's the key. Think about this too. <clears throat> the cost of keeping somebody in the prison system in Kentucky is about $24,000, $25,000 a year. It's a lot of money. Treatment programs don't cost $24,000, $25,000 a year in most instances, especially those that will help at the front end to intercede. The way we're going to cure this is through programs like the ANGEL Initiative. Is this in and of itself going to fix the problem? Of course not. But it is one way in which the state can do a better job of closing off that funnel of addiction. Because I'll be honest, whether we get more money from the federal government, whether we have more money in our budget, or whether we don't, there's no amount of money, there's no number of beds, that if we allow people to fall into this funnel of addiction, which is wide open and getting wider, there is literally no amount of money or beds that are going to address this problem at the bottom end of that funnel. There's not a, we will not be able to keep pace. We have to close off that funnel of addiction. So you close off the avenues through which people find themselves addicted and find themselves unable to deal with that addiction. We close off the inability of families to have access to places where they can get help, where they can bring in a, a, a shaking 90 pound you know, young adult in their family for help. You do that by basically you all helping us and you all helping us. And this website and this 1-800 number and us talking about it and destigmatizing the fact that this is a problem for us, this is how we close off that funnel of addiction. And here's the important thing to understand. The cost of incarcerating people, the vast majority of whom are there for nonviolent drug-related crimes, is $600 million a year in climbing. You wonder why we have troopers driving around in cars with 150 and 200,000 miles on them? You wonder why our troopers are using Vietnam-era military uh, throwaways as their law enforcement weapon? It's because we don't have the money, because we're spending it on things that if we intercede earlier, we can mitigate the cost. If we want to truly protect and serve, if we really want to be tough on crime so that we have more people on the roads and have a fully staffed state police, have the ability to intercede on the highways and get these people that are bringing 70 kilos of this and 30 pounds of that into our state, then we make sure they have the funding needed. And if it's going into our prison system, because we're not interceding through programs like this, it's going to be a downward spiral. The best way to protect us, the best way to be tough on crime is to be armed literally and figuratively and budgetarily with what we need to actually do it. All these things are connected.
There's no one solution, there's no one piece. But don't kid yourselves, they're all connected. Any other questions on anything as it relates to this initiative? I would like to say, if you're not learning, you're not living. And I want to announce on the 6th of this month, next week, we will be in Paducah, Kentucky, to have a round table with Dr. Pat Withrow. If you don't know Dr. Withrow, he's as passionate as Nancy Hale, as the governor, as John Tilly, as me. He's gathering some people there at the Baptist Health Hospital to talk about this problem and to help our post commanders in finding beds for these people. So we're learning, but, but we're, we're open for business, and we're going to do what we can to help those people that need, that need help. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.